A debt paid, written by the old world slayer. I grew up in the bustling Freeport city of Marienburg. I never knew my father. It was my uncle who took care of me and my mother. That was until the pox took her on my ninth summer. My uncle was a good man. Although a smuggler, he was respected. He taught me everything he knew about the smuggler's trade, from haggling with local merchants to evading the watchful eyes of the city guards to procuring illicit and highly coveted goods for street cleaners and burgomeisters alike. I learned how to navigate the treacherous waters of my profession and how to conceal our illicit goods from prying eyes. Together, my uncle and I had many successful and, on occasion, unsuccessful transactions up and down the rake even as far as Araby. But there was one rule that my uncle always drilled into me. For all the treasures ripe for the taking, Moussillon was never to be touched. Moussillon is a city of darkness, death and decay. It's a decrepit place with pitiful denizens, living in rotten hovels, ruled by gangs, pirates and unspeakable things alike. The once rich and opulent districts have since fallen into ruin and disrepair. The docks being one of the few, somewhat maintained areas which allow for some trade to take place, even if illegal by the laws of Bretonnia. The accursed barony of Moussillon itself has been quarantined both on land and sea by the cordon sanitaire. Over the centuries they have surrounded the barony by two dozen towers and patrols along the coast, especially around Moussillon itself. Soldiers, knights, and lords of the realm are tasked with keeping the plague-ridden city and land contained. They are known to be ruthless in their enforcement. Special permission for this area are granted only to a select few. Many years have passed since he told me of that city. I was young then. He used to say, We all have a debt that must be paid, no matter who we are. Sooner or later, the debt comes due. For my uncle, that debt came by way of a mugging in some back alley street in Talabheim. I did not even get the chance to recover his body before he was laid to rest in some public burial pit, let alone say goodbye. After his death, I was followed by a string of bad luck and poorly paid jobs. Such was my misfortune going on for years on end. One day, while being stuck in port at Bordelow, I met a wealthy merchant from Tilea who dealt in rare exotic goods. After some spiced Bretonian wine, the merchant shared with me rumors of hidden relics hidden deep within Moussillon. As soon as he uttered the name, my hair stood on end on the back of my neck. These artifacts he spoke of were of immeasurable value to those who knew their worth. He had learned of a ruined district that even the pirates and gangs did not venture to. The merchant said there was a shrine dedicated to some pompous knight that had the blessing of the lady. If whoever were to retrieve this artifact, he would pay a ransom for it. After staring into my goblet of red wine for a while, I swallowed and told him, I could be of service. Although scared of just the thought of going to that place, I knew that if I could get hold of that artifact, I could maybe give up this life and start a new one, a life with purpose, or at least one with coin to my name. So I took a risk and headed for the dreaded city of Moussillon. With some cunning and a little bit of luck, I followed the main roads without drawing any unwanted attention, under the disguise of a beggar. Eventually, I turned to the footpaths as I headed near to Moussillon. It took me a fortnight to get to border of Moussillon and Bordelot, and I could see the demarcation clearly, as one land was full of color while the other a sickly gray. With that, I headed for the watchtower of the Cordon Sanitaire, where the Italian merchant told me of a guard I would meet at a designated location. Once at the rendezvous, he took me through a marshy path with high dark reeds. Although we were clearly visible to some of the guards on the battlements, no alarm was sounded. I suppose the merchant had more than one man on his payroll. Once we made it through, he pointed me toward the direction of the city. You've got less than two days before the current garrison is swapped. Better make it quick, whatever it is. With that, we parted ways and my step quickened. I made it to Moussillon around midday. It was hard to determine the exact time as the clouds and fog obscured much of the sunlight. The city, if you could even call it that, was ghastly. Felled or crumbling walls and towers, mud and marsh water covering cobblestone streets. Whatever remaining standing structures there were leaned dangerously to one side or another. 
What did me in was the smell of the place, a tepid, murky stench that filled your nostrils and throat, with the smell of decaying flesh often joining in on the cacophony of rancid odors. I kept to the shadows. I was given a map to memorize the layout of the city in its prime upon accepting the job. Although not much help, it at least gave me some sense of where to go. As I was rounding a corner, I ran into a peasant girl who looked even worse than I. She hissed at me, showing disfigured yellow teeth, and darted past me. I suppose that was the most welcome I could expect to receive. From then on, I decided to do away with my disguise and have my sword and dagger easily available and ready for what may come. As I made my way further into the city, it became quieter. On occasion, a group of what I assumed were gangs or some pirates patrolling passed by. Although loud, even they seemed to feel a certain disquiet. Eventually, it began to rain. I made my way deeper into the city, wet, tired and not certain if I was heading in the right direction. Eventually, I came to what must have once been a square, although now littered with debris and some buildings were completely toppled into the square. In a distant corner, I noticed sickly green vines covering an arch. Moving closer, I could make out a symbol over the top of it, a knight's helm with a beast set atop it, though the vines obscured it. Peering through the bars, I could see stairs leading down. Better than nothing, I thought. Taking out my tools, I tried opening the gate. After some attempts, I finally managed to push the rusted lock mechanism open, careful to not make too much noise in the process. I made sure to lodge a small stone so that the gate would not fully close behind me, then lit a torch from a sconce, which to my surprise ignited immediately and made my way down. The walls were covered in detailed murals depicting some of the great deeds of the night buried herein. They were impressive, to say the least, although some were obscured by grime and in other places the plaster had peeled off entirely. After a long way down and finally reaching the bottom, I looked back up, the entrance was but a glimmer in the distance. My path continued down a straight corridor made of grey and white marble. The air here was cold when compared to the surface and I could almost see my breath. The light from my torch was the only thing piercing the dark. As I continued to head down the corridor, the space in front of me opened up, revealing a room set with columns and a large stone structure in the centre with a figure laying on top of it. As I drew closer... I could make out that it was a well-crafted stone carving of the knight's sarcophagus. This must be it. The Tilian merchant said that I need to not break through the sarcophagus, but find a mechanism around the sarcophagus lid near the head. After probing for several minutes, I managed to find a loose stone in the crown depicting a gem. Pressing on it triggered an audible click. The stone crown came undone and fell into my hand. Inside was what appeared to be a box, wrapped in fine black and yellow linen. I removed the linen and saw an intricately carved box made of gold and silver, inlaid with gems depicting some knightly story. The eerie quiet was cut short by voices coming down from the entrance. Just my luck. I placed the box inside the breast of my coat, moved towards one of the pillars in the room and snuffed out my torch. Moments passed and my heart began to beat faster in the dark. I felt as though something was creeping behind me. The voices from the entrance got louder and closer as I saw the faint glimmers of light getting brighter. Eventually four figures entered illuminating the tomb. Be this the place we're looking for, we was told it should be undisturbed. Judging by the gate, it's the opposite, said a gruff voice. Yeah. But you know, we ain't the only ones in this forsaken ruin of a city. It's likely nobody gets to check the crown, said another figure as they moved closer to the center. I carefully peered around the pillar to see all four figures heading to the sarcophagus, with none remaining to guard the entrance. Briskly and quietly, I moved toward the entrance, with one hand holding the golden relic and the other in my pocket. As I turned into the corridor, one of the four yelled out, Stop! This triggered me to yank the hand out of my pocket and throw the contents behind me. As the items clinked against marble and stone, I bolted straight for the exit. Upon reaching halfway in the corridor, yells and gasps of pain sounded behind me. The bastard threw down Caltrop! I'll skin the wretch! 
Not a moment later, I had reached the stairs and bounded up them, two at a time. It felt as though the climb was endless. Finally, though, the entrance was within reach and I cleared the gate. Looking back, the torchlight was getting nearer and the owls were getting closer. Or were those screams? Not pausing to consider, I kicked the stone away, locked the gate and moved away. Time to get out of this city. Before turning the corner, I looked back and saw two figures behind the gate, their hands covered in vines, outstretched, trying to get out. They seemed terrified. Abruptly, their hands disappeared behind the gate. Yells of abject terror were silenced by what sounded like bones crunching. Neither they nor the light of their torches was visible anymore. The quiet resumed. For a moment, I could only stare in bewilderment and dread. Then, not missing a step, I continued my escape out of the city in a brisk pace. Their fate was none of my concern. Luckily, my flight out of the city was successful and uneventful. Now all that was left was to move onwards to the rendezvous point with the guard. No longer having to worry about any of the gangs noticing me, I hastily made my way into the wilderness, straight towards the direction that I knew I had come from. In my single-mindedness of getting out of here, it took me longer than I would have liked to admit to notice that the path I was following was covered in marsh water. The cold sting of it against my ankle made me stop short and survey the surrounding area. The water was everywhere, somewhere more shallow, somewhere much deeper than just ankle height. Was it high tide? It did not make sense. Nonetheless, I carried on so as to put as much distance between myself and Moussillon as I could. The sky got dark and I realized I had been walking for hours. The tower was nowhere in sight. Neither was the familiar path. I knew I was walking in the right direction, but the surroundings seemed foreign. I stumbled upon an old rotting tree stump covered in moss, resembling the shape of a throne. Eyeing it cautiously, I approached it. I can't keep going like this forever. I need to rest, just for a bit. As soon as I had sat down, a heavy weariness took hold of me. Despite my struggle to keep my eyes open, they eventually closed, and I fell into a deep slumber. The rain greeted me when I woke up. It was heavier now, and the sky was still dark. I was soaked to the bone. Looking around, I wasn't sure of my location anymore. Getting up from the stump, I saw what could be barely considered a path, leading amongst some reeds and decided to follow it. As I headed along, my boots started sinking deeper in the mud. Soon the water reached my knees. I kept moving. The reeds were tall and obstructed most of my line of sight. I cursed myself for getting lost while being so close to the end of this endeavor. Through the reeds, I noticed a small rise amidst the stagnant water. It was covered in some trees and bushes. Hopeful, I made my way towards it. Upon reaching the bank, I tried climbing it up, but almost slipped on the muck covering it. Catching myself, I thankfully finally made it out of the water and looked around to gather my bearings. It was too hard to make out much beyond the nearby vicinity. The trees were young, frail, and thoroughly wet. The cold set into my bones through the soaked clothing as the temperature began to drop. I had to hold out one more night and I will be out of this Ranald forsaken place. Something moved in the water to my right and I looked towards the sound, but saw nothing. I heard the same on my left, and this time I took out my cutlass, ready to defend myself. Then a looming presence made itself known behind me, and I swiftly turned around. And there, but ten feet away from me, stood a hulking figure with two glinting eyes, boring into me. I wanted to scream, but fear had taken my voice. You carry something that does not belong to you. A raspy voice entered my mind. It made me jump and instinctively clutch the bejeweled artifact closer. I'm doing a job for an employer. What do you care anyhow? Who are you? I asked it with a semblance of courage as I readied my sword. It did not respond. Instead, it just kept staring at me. What do you want? I raised my voice. Still no response. After a moment of silence, the voice spoke again in my mind. I am one of the Grey Men. You trespass into these lands, stealing items from those long gone. The voice paused, speaking calmer now. Only by way of a riddle shall I offer you 
the way out. Do you accept? I nodded reflexively. It began reciting the riddle. Quill gripped steady in white bone hand. Mm, seas of red and black on a parchment land. Columns of history of regret and pride. An unsettled account means that you've died. What am I? As it said the last sentence, I could swear it was the voice of my uncle. Oh, wh what? I exclaimed. My mind began to race. I tried recounting the riddle, but I could only draw it a blank. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I will find my own way out. The grey man said nothing in reply. As I turned to move away, my legs would not budge. Looking down, I saw the earth quickly devouring my feet. Something wrapped around my ankles as I tried lifting them and would not let go. A frenzy settled in as I frantically began to slash around with my sword and dagger, attempting to get free. In my state, I did not even notice the artifact fall into the mud. Several cold, wet hands arose, grabbing my arms and neck, pushing me onto my back and into the mud. No matter how much I fought, they would not budge. The hands were unyielding. And then something pierced my skin, and I could feel a cold liquid enter my body. Finally, I opened my mouth to scream, but it was instead filled with cold water and mud. There was too much of it coming from nowhere. It was everywhere. It did not let me spit it out, cough it out, or breathe. Finally, a calmness came over me. My muscles gave up and I ceased fighting. Several glinting eyes stared down at me as I was lowered further into the dark of the marsh. Death, sooner or later, it comes due for all. Thank you for listening. A debt paid. The narration was possible thanks text-to-speech and speech synthesis technology to provide a more immersive storytelling experience. Till next time.